I'll just go through the main rules of inference that we'll be using in direct proofs. Uh, this is going to be kind of boring. You can skip it if you if you already have a good grasp of the um, main rules of inference, and you'll find all this in the text. But it's maybe worth for some of us talking through um, what they are and how they're motivated, etc. So let's take a look at them. So again, let's remember that we're interested in the ways that direct steps in direct proofs are licensed. So what is it that licenses a move? Um, these rules of inference are going to be the legitimate patterns that our steps can take. So remember we're dealing with the behavior of the operators. The operators here are going to be the main logical operators of sentences, of these formulas, compound sentences. So we'll begin with something like modus ponens and um, let's take a look at this, this one, this is the most familiar. So if we've got P then Q, if P then Q, and P as our premises, then we can conclude Q. And this is in some sense the most basic of the rules of inference. This is the rule of modus ponens. So when we make use of it in an inference, we might have all kinds of complexity, let's say, on either side of this conditional here. So there might be this this is a variable that could stand for an enormously complex sentence here. And Q might also be an enormously complex sentence over here. But the point is that they're joined together with the with the horseshoe. And the horseshoe here is the the MLO. And as long as the horseshoe is the MLO, then if you've got all this stuff over here as the antecedent, and all this stuff over here as the, con as the consequent, and if you have the antecedent repeated on a line by itself somewhere in your proof, then you can conclude the consequent. So we'll talk more about how these rules of inference can be applied to complex to much more complex sentences. The main point here is just to recognize that when we're talking about rules of inference, we're we're looking at the main logical operators of the sentences in question. Okay, so that was modus ponens, straightforward enough, your old friend. Modus tollens works as follows. So here you've got um, if p then q not Q, so the negation of the consequent as a premise, not Q, and then you can conclude not P. So if I go to the store, then I'll spend money. I didn't spend money, therefore I didn't go to the store. Okay any number of examples. Put your own example in there. That was a pretty crappy one, but put your own example in for modus tollens and you'll see it follows. So how do we know that it follows? How do we know that something like modus tollens can always be trusted? Well, the way you do it is you lay out the truth table. Again, how would you do that? You'd have the conjunction of the premises here. So you'd set up a, a um, sentence that went something like if, oops, let's try this again. If P then Q, and not Q, you can join the two premises here, join them with an and, and you'd say if you've got this, then you've got not P. You'd run your truth table and you'd find, once you did that, that underneath the horseshoe here, it came out all true. Okay, so you can test the, you can test the legitimacy or the validity of the rules of inference using the truth tables. So you don't have to take my word for it. So how how about this one? Here this is called hypothetical syllogism. Hypothetical syllogism 
says that if you have P then Q and if you have Q then R you can conclude that if P then R okay uh, again I'm not going to give you a proof of that you can do that yourself um, but it's sort of intuitive I think disjunctive syllogism our old friend um, if P or Q and not P then Q and likewise if P or Q and not Q then P so you can have cake or ice cream and you can't have ice cream therefore you can have cake constructive dilemma let's take a look at this so if you've got if P then Q and if R then S on one line here at the beginning and if you've got P or R these are your premises then you can conclude Q or S so it's kinda of like this right so if you if you know that these two conditionals are true right so if you know that the conjunction of these two conditionals is true and you know that either P is true or R is true then you can conclude well if P were true then Q would hold and if R were true then you'd have S so you know that if you have P or R then you have Q or S you can validly conclude Q or S so again if you don't believe me um, run the truth table how do you do that well you join the two premises together with the AND again stick them at the beginning as the antecedent of a conditional put your conclusion in as the consequent of the conditional run the truth table if they come out all true you've got a valid schema simplification may be the simplest we know that if you have P and R as a premise that you can conclude P or you could also conclude R so if you know that you can have cake and you can have ice cream then you know you can have cake and you know you you can have ice cream so by by the rule of simplification the rule of conjunction runs as follows if you need to do this if you have P on if you need to conjoin two premises you can so what does that mean well if you have P on a line by itself if you have Q on a line by itself then you could conclude P and Q and you might need that for some purposes in proofs finally this one always upsets students this is the rule of addition the rule of addition says you can given any premise like P over here you can con conclude you can con con <laughs> sorry you can conclude P or Q and basically you can add anything with the disjunction so if you have P if you know that P is true then it's also true that P or anything at all okay and if you think about that for a little bit you'll see why you know that if you have P if P is true then P or anything at all will be true it's the rule of addition so by the rule of addition you can add things with the disjunction as you wish to premises let's talk about De Morgan De Morgan's law um, goes as follows if you have the negation of a conjunction like this if you have the negation the denial of P and Q then you can conclude not P or not Q now if you think about it so think about the truth table for the for conjunction for the AND the truth table for AND is TFFF right so if you have the truth table is TFFF the negation of course is going to give you F the negation of, of that um, 
conjunction will give you FTTT. And FTTT just basically says, look, what we've got here is a situation where either the second, third, or fourth cases obtain. So here we've got we've got P and not so in the second case, we've got P and not Q. In the third case, we've got not P. and Q. And in the fourth case, we've got not P and not Q. So you know you've got either not P or not Q in either of these, and it could be both. Okay, so the denial of a conjunction is equivalent to the assertion of cases 2, 3, and 4 on the truth table. Cases 2, 3, and 4 are equivalent to this guy right here, not P or not Q. Okay, here's another version of De Morgan's Law. This is the denial of a conjunction, sorry, disjunction. So the denial of a disjunction lets you conclude the conjunction of the negation of the two disjuncts. That's a bit of a mouthful, but basically the idea here is, you know, we know that um, the truth table for the disjunction is going to be T, 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 F. And we know that the negation of that would be F, 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 T. So F, F, F and T. So we know that really what we have to be concerned about is the fourth case. And the fourth case is the case where P is false and the case where Q is false. So in the fourth case, you've got not P and not Q. So the fourth case is equivalent to this guy. Okay, why was that again? Well, this is the disjunction that's when it's not negated, TTTF. The negation of the disjunction then is FFFT. And so we say then that the negation of the disjunction is true only in the fourth case. And the fourth case of the truth table is the case where not P is true and not Q is true.